Okay. Hey. Hi. Are you ready? I'm so ready. Ah, well, let's go then. Well, I want to welcome you, uh, welcome everybody who's watching to the inaugural pilot episode of Sips and Songs. Um, the idea of this is just to explore beer or various other drinks and, you know, kind of the correlation between drinks and uh, flavors and tastes along with music, um, more or less basically uh, how would you pair music with your drink. So for today we've got three beers. We've got Austin Beer Works' uh, Fire Eagle IPA. I've got New Holland's Dragon Milk. This is actually their bourbon barrel aged. And then we've got Prairie Artisan Ales Mocha Noir. I'm so excited about all the, these beers that I think I told you this before we started, but I've only ever heard of the Austin Beer Works Fire Eagle. I've never even heard of the other ones. Should we feel like opening up our Fire Eagles? I've got it right here, Tosho. <gasps> oh, yes. Ah. And I have, so I have these little glasses here. So is that a good choice? I like to drink my IPAs straight from the bottle, straight from the can. Does that do something for, like, with an IPA? Does that do something? Uh, supposedly, you know, it helps all the air come out and all this, the smell, the blossom. I don't know. I, I enjoy being a beer snob, but I, I only take it so far. Should we take a sip real fast and see what you're, you know, give it a swish? Am I correct that I'm getting, um, I feel like I get a little floral, like I get some rose in there. Yeah, I taste a little bit of floral. It's interesting, like IPA, so that stands for India Pale Ale, right? Right. So um, thinking, like taking a sip and feeling like there was a rose sort of smell and then a rose flavor in there made me think of this duet that I sing with Julia Taylor a lot, the flower duet from the mm. opera Lakme. And the opera is set in India and they're singing about jasmine and roses. So that's totally what it just made me think of. I love that. I've always thought of, I don't know, I was, I was thinking about, uh, you know, what IPAs usually kind of remind me of. And I want to say for me, it's almost more like Baroque music. Hmm. I generally say, well, you know, Baroque music can be very floral, it can be florid, but it's not overly melancholy, it's not overly dramatic, you know, whereas you've obviously got like Mahler or, and Wagner and and later composers for, you know, like, you know, it's just, it's either, it tends to be either fairly straightforward emotionally, you know, there's like an emotion going on. There, I think there was a phrase for it. Wasn't there like um, humors or something? Like broke music, it wasn't intended to be joy. It was, a, it was this idea of we will set up a place where you can experience joy. So the music was happy, but it wasn't like emotion. Just kind of like here, you can have this emotion here. So I find it not overly, you know, not overly crazy. It's just, it's very, it's, it's just very stately. I don't know. Mm, I love <laughs> that. Yeah. And so for our um, folks out there who might not know exactly the time period of Baroque, of the Baroque era, we're talking like 1600 to middle of the 18th century-ish. Yeah, 1751, 1750, I think, is, mm -hmm. uh, with Bach's, Bach's death is officially when we kind of close off the Baroque era. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I think of Toccata and Fugue. Not the Toccata, which, you know, everybody knows. -da 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 That's the Toccata. I think more of the, um, the second half, the Fugue, which is something blanking on how that goes completely. <laughs> But it's just there, you know, it's not overly, overly sentimental. It's not dark and heavy. It's just kind of there. Um, and to me, that's kind of what an IPA feels like. It's, it's nice and tasty, but it's not trying to go anywhere. Mm. So, I don't know. so IPAs were the first beer that I really started um, experimenting with in terms of like, you know, what does this beer flavor mean to me? It was the first thing that I ever, or the first beer that I ever tried that I kind of was like, oh wait, beer, it's this thing. Um, and for me, uh, you know, it was like, I remember I was at the Westbury, which is a bar that used to be in Philadelphia. And um, I remember taking a sip, I, it wasn't the Fire Eagle IPA, I'll be honest about that front. I think it was Bell's Two Hearted. Uh, but I just, I was sitting there sipping it and I was like, 
the image of of unsweetened iced tea was what kind of it, it was a it was like this kind of reminds me of unsweetened iced tea mm. and up until then you know i'd been drinking like your standards like the corona with lime pbr whatever um and it was that moment i was like wait unsweet iced tea hops all this kind of came together and all of a sudden i started to kind of like it make started making sense i'm like okay these are the flavors this is kind of how i need to approach this but it wasn't always quite that technical it was kind of like oh wait <laughs> what year are we talking 2008 maybe so i don't know and i think ipa should be fresh and cold you want to have nice and crisp and cold this is really lovely. So, um, oh, I see it has 7.3% alcohol by volume. Mm. So that's, this is a serious beer. IPAs do tend to be on the higher side for um, alcohol. Um, yeah, I didn't realize, I don't think I realized this one was 7.3. I think the national average is, I want to say Bud Light or all those the com more commercial beers are generally around, yeah, three to 5%. Mm -hmm. um, so this is on the higher side. It's not the highest. I've had some beers which kind of go up into the 18% alcohol, which Ooh, wee. Is, yeah, <laughs> it's an experience. <laughs> That's a fun night. <laughs> um, and like I said, for me, the importance with the IPA was that was kind of my first spot where I realized that beer, there was more to beer than just drinking in a bar and getting drunk and having fun with people. It was, there was a whole flavor profile of yada, yada, yada that I could explore. Oh, kind um, of that, do, you, do you think there's some similarities between uh, your discovering beer and discovering music and more music in your life? Yeah, I just remember when, you know, where I grew up, we, music was fairly straightforward. You know, I think we kind of, I think uh, the music that I heard growing up outside of pop, of course, uh, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, maybe some maybe some Strauss, um, you know, obviously, of course, you have the famous uh, Zarathustra theme, you know, in 2001, dong, dong, dong. but you never hear past that. That's about it, you know. Um, yeah, uh, I was drawn to a lot of things that I was always drawn to color and timbres and textures and music. Um, so yeah, you know, there's subtle currents that you can have in the flavors of beer Okay. For me, I went to college and I studied initially, I was studying music composition. Uh, I kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere, California, so my, my musical knowledge was fairly small. And uh, uh, at Oberlin, my, you know, I mean, I, I can't even get my hands out far enough. So I grew up, you know, with a fairly traditional sense of what music was. And then when I got to uh, Oberlin, and I started discovering Webern, Stravinsky, um, Chostakovich actually was fairly new to me, I think. Uh, but uh, Penderecki, oh, good heavens. Uh, Sofia Gavadalina is somebody that I discovered when I was at Oberlin. You know, so all these kinds of even more crazy things that, um, you know, like, I guess if you were to compare it to alcohols, you know, it's the more experimental, the artisanal beers, and, you know, the ones we always joke about, you know, like it's aged with goat's blood or, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. <laughs> So I think my, you know, kind of my level of experimentation started back then musically, whereas, of course, like I said, with beer, it wasn't until about 2008, I want to say, 2008. Um, and Oberlin, so Oberlin's known for having a really fabulous music program, and it's yes. in Ohio, right? Yep, it's about 30 minutes west of Cleveland. Okay. And it's a conservatory of about 3,000 students, I think. Um, or I'm sorry, no, the, the Oberlin College total, I think, is around 3,000. Oh, good heavens, this is 20 years ago now that I was there last, so <laughs> forgotten details. Uh, the city itself is probably about 10,000, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a tiny, tiny little cozy little place in the middle of nowhere, Ohio. Where great stuff happens. You know, thinking about, like, discoveries of, like, um, first discovering a certain kind of music or expanding your knowledge of music or expanding your knowledge of beer and wanting to dig a little deeper. It makes me think of the first time I really thought of music in a much bigger way. I was uh, 10 years old and my father was a classical concert pianist and I'd heard him playing music my whole life. You know, it's just like was in in the house, in the in the world. It wasn't I didn't think it was like 
you know, I didn't put it up on a pedestal. I used to play with my dolls under the piano while my dad practiced. It was very relaxed like that. And so he would always be practicing at home and we'd go hear him perform. And I was like, oh, that's what he's been practicing. But there was this one moment when we all went to see him perform the um, Rachmaninoff fantasy on a theme what, uh, by pa Paganini or, you know what I'm talking about? I can't so. think of the name of it. Fantasy, Fantasia on a theme of Paganini. I don't know if I'm getting all the words just right, but everybody in the audience was like, bawling, bawling, bawling at the end, up on their feet, applauding, because it's just like this huge, like amazing journey, this piece of music, this piano concerto. And uh, I was like, oh, and I really loved the music. It really resonated with me. And I was just like, oh, this is why people make a big deal about music. You know, it, it can uh, bring us together in this really unique and special way. Wow. Well. And if you want to cut all of that out, please feel free. I feel like I need to stay on that. I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm, I'll finish my fire eagle later, but I've got, I'm going to grab the dragon's milk. I'm going to have a bite of my salty snack I got at Trader Joe's. Oh, yes. They always have great salty snacks. The bottle alone is making me miss Game of Thrones. I have my, what is this? Austin bottle opener. That's awesome. Music live music capital of the world. Let's hope it stays that way. I'm gonna go ahead. Careful. Open mine carefully. Oh. I'm gonna use my cup for this one. I'm gonna do exactly what you do. Yep. Awesome. So Dragon's Milk was the first beer that I ever took a photo of. I don't even remember why. Like what prompted that whole experimentation, that whole part of my journey. And how many beers have you taken photos of since? Unique beers is, um, I want to say 1,600. Oh my gosh, wow. Yep. All, all different? All different. Wow. I, have, I discovered that, at least at the time, Facebook's limit on pictures in a photo album is 1,000. <laughs> and then I had to start a new one, and I want to say I have about 500 mm. in one. I, should have checked that number before we started, but I didn't. So, yeah, it smells crazy. great. Mm. Ooh, it's kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. I've noticed ooh, it was almost like a flavor of Coca Cola. Mm. Man, I can smell the bear. I can smell smell the bourbon right before we sip it, and then I can taste it in the sort of in the back of the palate at the end of the sip. Mm -hmm. At the linger, I think is what they call it. <laughs> at the linger. Yeah. I think stouts actually do a little better, a little warmer. So uh, this, this first sip is nice, but they t uh, as they warm up, they the flavor tends to relax, release. So we'll... Mm. Oh I'm man, gonna... it's so good. And the, um, the carbonation seems like just right. It's a little fizzier than I'm used to with uh, with stouts. A little more to it. Um, mm. I usually think of stouts as being a, f a fluffier mouth feel or something. You know, it's creamier. Um, so what what music does this make you think of? This I would say is probably getting into more like the Mahler. I was think just thinking Mahler, no joke. I should have written it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> I remember uh, this, speaking of them all, my favorite memory is um, when I was at Oberlin, like I said, I started off as a music composition major, but then decided to add bass performance. I'd been playing bass since junior high um, and I auditioned and got accepted into the program. And the first, the first uh, symphony or first piece that I ever did with the Oberlin Orchestra was Mahler Six, which is, you know, this great military march. Dum, 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 da dum, dum, da dum. I'm not singing it right at all, but so we got these basses going, chunk, 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 chunk. And so it's a nice, it's an A minor, Symphony Six in A minor, I should say. <laughs> um, and that's just kind of what I think. It's, you know, stouts tend to be nice and dark. Um, they can still be happy. This has got a nice little bit of sweetness. And if you know Mahler Six, there's some nice sweet little moments in there. 
Oh my gosh, Mahler has such sweetness in some of his music. It's always so big and sort of, there are like very intimidating moments, but then at the heart of it, you know, there are those moments that you're just like overwhelmed with really heartfelt beauty. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think of when, I'm, when I think of a stout is something, or maybe Wagner, I'm not as familiar as Wagner's works. Uh, Strauss, especially some of the, um, I think Str with uh, Strauss, it, Strauss tends to be a little more fun. Johann Strauss for sure. Even Richard Strauss. Um, well, when I think of, yeah, when I think of Mahler versus Strauss, I think Strauss has been a little lighter. Yeah, oh yes, for sure. Because I mean, Mahler went dark by this, what was it, ninth or 10th symphony? I forget how many symphonies they both have. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, I don't know his music well enough to I'd be able to identify which, like if I heard something, I don't know that I would be able to identify which one it goes with. I can identify his music pretty, it's pretty recognizable to me, um, but specifically, I don't know. And then he went on to conduct mm -hmm. the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. Oh, he did? I don't think that's a made up fact. Maybe I should look it up. He conducted in New York, <laughs> Mahler, I, but I think he was the conductor there. Hmm. You know what? Let's ask Google. You know the other composer that I think of when I think of Stouts? I think of, um, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, Shostakovich. Also. Ooh, yes. yeah. Real, real rich. Um, like I said, I thought for some reason I had it in my head this is a milk stout, but I don't see that actually being listed on here as their style. And of course, as with all beers, there's just so many different styles. There's milk stouts, coffee stouts. Um, Chocolate stouts. Okay, I'm pretty sure he did. He did do. He did conduct at the Met. But like, I, th I think of Shostakovich just being playful. Also, I mean, we've got that Russian seriousness, but also playful. Um, I remember we did uh, Shostakovich five in college. It was a student. It was a student uh, conductor. And my favorite thing about the piece is that there's this crazy moment where, as bass players, uh, we're actually reading Trouble Clef. If you're not a musician, that probably won't mean anything to you. If you're a musician and you know that the bass players, we don't really bass clef. Cellos will often read in treble clef. Basses solo will read in treble clef. In orchestral music, never. Um, but we're actually in unison with cellos. We're not an octave lower. We're in unison playing middle C and higher. And it's just this horribly goofy moment. I'm just like, why? <laughs> what? what was the point of this? Uh, but, you know, it's wonderfully dark. I, I'm not going to try and sing this. It's a crazy little line, but it's just like, what is the point of this? Is this, is it for the timbre? Is it just to be weird? What? I don't know. Yeah, he must have been trying to pull you up somehow and just your thinking of where the music was sitting. Yeah. It's a choice. If this beer was a singer, I'm going to say I think it'd be a bass baritone, not quite a bass. Actually, if the fizz were less, maybe a bass. But with the fizz, I think it gives it that just a little bit more of a pointy for a little bit more forward, a little bit more forward aggressive. I was actually thinking almost like Maria Callas, nice dark voice, rich and thick, mm -hmm. but still bright. Complex, <laughs> complex person for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as it's warming up, I can taste a little more of the, the malts. It's lots of malts. A little less of it. There was at first, when I first tasted it, it was a little sweet. Like I said, it's a strange way of explaining it, but you know, there's a, there's a moment where it kind of tastes like flat Coca-Cola. It's got that kind of dark flavor that's slightly sweet. Yeah, I'm Most getting like molasses. I'm getting a little bit molasses. And if I if there were any if there was any fruit in it, I think it would be like prune, but like in a good way. I would think prunes get a bad rap. Like a, a happy and delicious prune. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water so I can clear my my throat. Oh yes, always good to have water handy because this beer is uh eleven percent alcohol. Yep. Oh, we. It's amazing that this whole world of options for beer drinking exists too. I mean, it, it's 
totally an adventure. Yeah, it's been really fun watching beers, you know, uh, um, artisanal beers and microbreweries really explode. Um, I feel like I'm kind of on the tail, uh, behind the, the boost. I think I kind of joined after it really started taking off. Um, but it's still been fun to watch, you know. I, it's one of my favorite things to do is when we go out is, you know, find a beer on the list. I'm like, I've never heard of this one, I'm taking that one. Is that something you do when you travel too? I know it's something that I do if I'm traveling any place. Um, back in the days when we traveled a lot, like <laughs> making sure I know if there's any local breweries or distilleries or even wineries where we're, we're gonna be near or within walking distance or accessible via public transportation. Um, I've had a lot of fun with that. Have, is mm. that something that you do when you travel? Um. I don't necessarily find the, the breweries, but uh, when we go out, I definitely look for, you know, what's on the list and uh, what I haven't heard of. If I know of a brewery in the area, um, then I will definitely look up theirs. Excuse me. Well, that's a really good way to like actually find out what's in the area is wherever you are. I mean, so many, so many nice places now are focused on like local or even casual places, whatever, are focused on uh, local beers and things. So that's a really good way to discover what's happening in, in the city. Yeah. I remember uh, we went to Chicago once and I found out about, uh, I almost said Great Lakes, <laughs> wrong, wrong brewery, um, Goose Islands. Oh yeah. And th that's a brewery big um, in Chicago. And they have an amazing line called uh, the Bourbon County brand. And oh my goodness, uh, I was at a, randomly in a bar and downstairs and you know I went to the, the list and I found one I think it was like $14 for you know like eight ounce which to me is usually like a sign that something is going to be magical or just be worth the adventure you know <laughs> maybe something I hate but you know where else am I going to get a beer like this um turns out I can get it a lot of places now but you know whatever uh, <laughs> and I think I remember I remember very vividly that I ordered it he poured it and got about that much and the cake kicked. And it's like, do you want it? I'm like, yeah, I'll take it, find out. And it, it was, yeah, it was an amazing, I, I don't I don't remember which one it was, but um, it was an amazing, amazing two sips of beer. <laughs> and then I ordered something. Um, two tiny little sips. You should have ah. put it into a little thimble. And sipped it very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, so good, okay. And generally when I'm out, you know, I can only drink like half a, half a bottle. I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> there's a great brew, uh, brew pub beer place up here in, in the Mueller area called uh, Witchcraft. They used to have a spot down in South Lamar. That's no longer there. They're now up in Mueller, yay for me. Um, but you know, with all these places where you can get, you know, like five ounce pours, uh, and, I don't need a whole lot. I don't, you know, I'm not here to get drunk. I'm here to, to, to taste and explore the, the flavors. Mm -hmm. So having these small little glasses is perfect for me. Yes, this is really nice. Okay, so should I put this back in the fridge and get the other one? Yep. Oh my gosh. I just love this artwork. I love it. It's so cute. It's like a, it's like a cute little butterfly scaler tin. Yeah, little uh, Dia de Muertos kind of ish. Totally. Mocha Noir. Yeah. I mean, just say Mocha, right? And like many people, including myself, will be like, okay, sold. I'm in. I have to admit that I usually, I usually avoid the coffee or ones. Um, Are you a coffee drinker? I love coffee. I, I but I'm uh, the funny thing is I'm very particular about coffee. I have a very specific flavor profile that I want. Um, so I'm not a snob. I'm just picky. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, my problem with with a lot of coffee po uh, porters and coffee stouts is they tend to go super bitter. The number of times I've tasted one, I'm like I feel like I'm sucking on an ashtray. It's just like. <sighs> oh no 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 no. Um, so I. I don't remember when I first had Prairie Artisan Ales. It, they're, but it, um, I want to say at least half of everything that I've had of theirs, I've, or no, not even not more than half. I want to say 90% of what I've had of theirs I've loved. Um, sorry, half sounds so conservative. Um, to flip the coin. 
but this is yeah, this is a mocha noir. They don't really say anything. A bourbon where, barrel. Where, where's the prairie artisan ales from? They are in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh my, really? Yeah. So it's not that far away. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. It's a bourbon barrel aged stout with coffee and natural flavors. Again, bourbon barrel aging, um, which I love. I love the barrel aging thing. I know some people complain about it, but I love it because it just adds layers of flavors. And ooh, wow, I can smell that. Let's take a smell and a Oh, sip. whoa, yeah. Yeah, that, you, that's a- You <laughs> chose, whoa, it even looks thick, pouring it into the glass, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's the chocolate. That's what it is. It's like, it's like the, um, it's like dark chocolate. Like, you know, I don't know, maybe it's like 80% real chocolate, dark chocolate or something. It smells so strong of chocolate. Mm, and lots of oats in there too. Very... Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, this would be amazing over vanilla ice cream, over chocolate, ice cream, mm. over coffee ice cream. This is desserty. Yes. Mm. So what does it make us think of with music? But it's exotic too. This is exotic. I would put maybe Stravinsky, like his mid era or not mid, like, uh, you know, it's probably early, you know, like around Firebirds and Rite of Spring. Ooh, yes. Because you've got this familiarity. It's not as out there as obviously like uh, Penderecki or some of the more experimental composers, George Crumb. No, it's not. It's not quite that far out. But it's also very sweet and very, like if, uh, hmm. At the same time, I always think of, I always think, I love Stravinsky. I, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing him. One of the things I loved about listening to, to Stravinsky when I was in college was I felt like it was music that I could write. You know, you like, you listen to Mozart, you listen to Mahler and Strauss and just, just all these things going on. And you, I, I would always feel kind of like, I could never write that. With Stravinsky, I always felt like this is something I can do. This is something I can do. I can write, you know, it's, again, it's kind of, it's not super moody. Um, necessarily, I, I say that again in the, like the middle of the rite of spring is like this creepy <laughs> moment, beginning of the second act. It's kind of spooky, um, but yeah, it, it was music that I, I could really attach to, and I felt inspired rather than demoralized. <laughs> but he's also he's yeah yeah I, I don't think of him as being something uh, at least most stuff that I'm familiar with. Right of Spring, you know, I'm still really happy music. Uh, Firebird again is gorgeous. It's dark, um, but that ending, you know, with uh, the French horns and the cellos. Let me sing it right. Gorgeous. It's nice and somber, but it's not like, it's not super moody. This makes me think of the pianist Marta Argerich mm. because she is intense and mysterious and uh, shy, but also extroverted. And this also a little bit because of the um, coffee and the chocolate, it makes me think a little bit of the Piazzolla. And maybe I'm thinking of tangos and thinking of the dance of the tango involving mm. two individuals in the coffee and chocolate mix mm. or something, but a little Piazzolla and also a little Marta Argerich. Ooh. But at the same time, I'm also getting maybe a little Chopin or something. Ooh. You know, it's very floaty, very, I don't know. Maybe it's the dessert and the decadence of Paris mm -hmm. in the time of Chopin. And although Paris was so decadent when Chopin was, uh, you know, playing in salons and things, he was kind of, I'm sure he was decadent in his own way, but he was definitely out 
decadenced by many of the people he surrounded himself by. You know, he was kind of like sort of shy and reserved in a way. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it doesn't, his, his music is very, very extroverted. Very it's moody. More, yeah, it's a lot more contained though. I think of Liszt as being someone who, you know, oh, oh yeah, it's all about. That was Liszt. Well, what, what's the story about Liszt? He was like the rock, he was like a rock star of the day, and he mm -hmm. would go out for, um, to play his concerts, and he'd take off his gloves and throw them into the audience, and women would swoon, and probably men swoon would swoon as well. I remember the story that he would plant someone in the audience to faint at the hardest, at the most difficult spot, so that he would have to stop them. He wouldn't have to play it. You've got to be kidding. That's a story I heard. I'm well, I have tried to sing some of the songs that Liszt has written, and they are very difficult. Like, I, pianistically, I know he wrote difficult stuff because he could play in a way that not a lot of other people could. Um, but, you know, it's, he's in the standard repertoire. But vocal music, you don't see him in, show up in vocal music very often. His stuff was, is really difficult. I, I'm glad you said that because I didn't, was not even aware that he'd written any songs. Yeah, so, and Chopin actually wrote some beautiful songs, um, many beautiful songs. And one set that I've sung is a set of Polish songs because he was originally from Poland. So he, and he always had like a really strong pull to that country and he wrote these songs in Polish. So I want get, to get back to those some, someday and really sing them in Polish. I think I actually sang them in French. There was a French version and an English version, but. I'd love to sing him in Polish and work with somebody who really knows the language. Mm. One of the beers that I was hoping to have for today is the Bishop's Barrel series, which is uh, a series by um, St. Arnold's Brewery, where they're based down, is it Houston or is it San Antonio? Sorry, I'm suddenly blanking. I think they're Houston. I know they're Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> the big um, country of Texas. Yeah, I know. Uh, but. Uh, Bishop's Barrels, Bishop's Barrel number four was another seminal point in my kind of beer exploration. Uh, it was here in Austin, uh, went to a place I, down on, it wasn't quite Sixth Street. It was, it's a place that's gone now, but changed a couple times. And I said to the bartender, you know, give me something weird. What's the weirdest thing you've got? And he's like, well, I've got this Bishop's Barrel. Go for it. And I remember, very vividly, that was the first point where, as I was drinking, I could feel different flavors kind of going into my mouth. Not just in like sip flavor, sip like as I was sitting in my mouth, I could feel and taste different things going on. As you know, just I like music. You know, if it's got you've got your melody, you've got your accompaniment, you've got your counterpoint going on. It was an amazing, eye-opening experience. I probably would feel less impressed by the beer now. Um, just because I've, you know, you've had it, I've had it, and I've gone on to so many others. I mean, like this, this is, this is a, really good. Yeah, Prairie really? Ars and Hills. You can't drink a whole lot, so you know, that's I can share this little bottle. Just the right amount, right? Like you can, mm -hmm. you could take this bottle, sit by the fire, put on some Stravinsky or some Piazzolla whatever you're feeling like, you wanna really challenge your ear and like not talk. If you listen to Stravinsky, you're not gonna to wanna to talk to the person you're sharing the beer with probably, just listen to the music. But if it's Piazzolla, you can talk, you can have a conversation and sit by the fire and share this beer. That's like a perfect night. You know, that's a good date, that's a good date night. We should recommend mm -hmm. that as a date I night. Do. Or, a, or a, take yourself on a date, you know, you whatever, whatever works. This is really special. I totally am sitting here feeling so appreciative of this opportunity to try these new things and have this conversation because we've been living in this really strange time where a lot of spontaneity and fun has had to shift into different <laughs> sort of <laughs> worlds. And I, I feel like I, you know, I feel a little bit like I've been traveling, having these conversations and drinking this beer with you and, and um, seeing new things and thinking about new things and having new 
new experiences. So thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to talk about this this stuff and to drink this delicious beer. You you are hired for beer selector of whatever we do, anytime. I, I love exploring beer and I love uh, bringing people along. Um, I know that some beers can be challenging. Some people don't like beer. I think if, when I think of IPAs, I think of the beer that people don't want if they don't like beer. I mean, I think this is kind of, this, when people think of, you know, all those flavor profiles that they don't like about beer, I wouldn't start somebody on an IPA. Um, I think that's, can be a little challenging. Um, we, we were watching TV the other day and there was a scene where a guy walks in, I don't need this setup, but he, he walks in and the bartender's like, you know, do you want something? And he's like, I'm not really much of a drinker. So, but one of his friends like, hey, I get him something. And so she's like, oh, I'm great. The bartender says like, oh, I'm great at this kind of stuff. Let me go grab something. She brings back, she gives it to him. And she's like, it's a double IPA. And I'm sitting here and I was like, this is not gonna end well. <laughs> I, I love a double IPA. Uh, if you are, if you're looking to get into beer, um, there's the uh, 90 minute IPA by Dogfish Head and they're 120 minutes. Those don't taste like IPAs anymore at that point. They're just kind of off in their own world. But yeah, I was just like, why would you give someone a double IPA to begin with? That's, that's like trying to do your first dive off the three meter board. I feel, and <laughs> that's a good, that's a good uh, point to make, especially if folks are thinking about trying an IPA for the first time. I think the Fire Eagle is such a great first IPA. And again, like it really made me think of the flower duet from Loch May, which is so easy listening. Besides the fact that it's easy listening, it's also something that you've heard before. It's like, oh, this reminds, I've, I know this, I know these sounds and like this beer. It's like, oh, I know these flavors. I've had these flavors before in something. It's also, the Fire Eagle's nice. Um... It's got a lot of sweetness. It's got plenty of malt. Um, the hops are really what give it that bitter flavor. Um, I'm not an expert at brewing beer, but I know that hops uh, bring out the bitterness. That's just what they do. Um, so it's nice when they can, you know, some beers can be just all about the, the hops. Uh, the West Coast style IPA is, tends to be very bitter, very bitter, um, what they're known for. And you know, without that that malt to kind of back it up, it can be. Whew. We have a little bit more of that mocha noir. Oh, it's good. So good. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm have also... dessert. I'm having dessert before dinner. Mm. This is a beer that needs to be chilled, but not cold. Mm -hmm. think, have you noticed that when it gets warmer, it just there's more flavor. Yeah, mine is a little colder than room temperature at the moment, and it's delightful. It's kind of fun to do that though. It's also, you know, you take it out and you first crisp and then just to, to watch the flavors change as you drink it. Oh, I hear the garage door open. Tim's probably gonna come through the door soon. That's fine, but you might just have to edit that out. Or not, whatever you want. Lucky this. Hello. We've got it. Well, do you know, you know each other, don't you? Of course. Yep. Is he Tosho? Uh, Tosho knows so much about beer and we are having a party over here. And so you great. Can share your, you can share your uh, mocha noir. Or maybe not. That's up to you. <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> oh, mine. Cheers. Mm. Cheers. Oh, we, should, we, didn't inter we didn't introduce ourselves at all. Oh, should we introduce ourselves now? Yes. So thank you for joining me, Liz. And you are the executive director of the Armstrong Community Music School here in Austin. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Um, so I've been part of the Armstrong Community Music School family since I moved here in 2004 and I started as a voice teacher and I'm still teaching voice there 16 years later. Um, and uh, I've been the executive director for a few years now. I've had the pleasure of holding that position. I've held other positions in the school as well. Um, I also have an opera company in town. It's called Lola Local Opera Local Artists. And I do some singing. Lots of singing. Lots of singing. And you're good at it. Oh, thank you. Chucks. How about you, Tosho? I, you know, I feel really grateful, actually, that you uh, approached the Armstrong Community Music School and you moved here from Philadelphia. Yeah. So um, what year was that? I don't remember. I was 2012. 
Oh my gosh, right when we moved in, you were like the first, the first one in the in the new building when we moved in. Yeah, I heard about the Armstrong Community Music School through my former job uh, in Philadelphia at Settlement Music School. And uh, one of my coworkers there said, hey, you should check this uh, school out. I sent an email uh, with a resume to Margaret and heard nothing for a couple months, you know, as, as things can go with jobs, you know, you send your resume out and hear nothing. But then, yeah, I was probably August or so, I suddenly got this email from Margaret saying, I'm so sorry, we've been really busy with a move. Um, I'm just now getting your email and getting back to you. And yeah, that's, that was kind of the beginning of things. I started working there briefly on Saturdays and then started helping out more with the front desk because I knew the software. And then I started teaching little kids and it's just kind of blossomed from there. And now you're the early childhood music coordinator and mm -hmm. you're on the registration team, registrar team, and, um, <laughs> and uh, you do all kinds of behind the scenes stuff for the school. I mean, the list, the list goes on and on. Well, we're really fortunate and community music schools are so special. You know, there's such a special environment uh, rooted in really amazing beliefs about what a community can be and how individuals can flourish through music. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about Armstrong is that it is very community based. Um, you know, I know having been through the conservatory system and I don't hate it. I know there are other people who have been through the conservatory system and just uh, was not their place, which is fine. Um, you know, it's all about self exploration. You know, you're not here to study the piano to become the next prodigy. If you have that capacity, great, we'll encourage you. But if you just want to learn so that you can play your, um, you know, your pop songs, you know, when you're sitting at home and you need to express yourself, maybe you need to put on some uh, good heavens, I can't even think of a good, <laughs> you know, if you, yeah, if you have a, a pop song that you want to play on and you know, let your, you know, your, your pain out, you can do that. Or if you're classical music, you know, if maybe you want to play your, Maybe if playing a Chopin uh, piece helps release, then yeah, you can do that. Or if, you know, even your basic early, early uh, Beethoven, ba da dee dee da ba bum bum bum. Right? I don't know if that's yeah. Beethoven. No, that's it Mozart. Uh, no, it's, it's somebody else. Or is it Haydn? I don't it's early, it's early classical, but I remember it. Uh, it's, it's, it's in like those books that you get that's that have all of those composers in there. And what am I, why am I thinking of a C, a C name or C name or a K name? Kabalevsky? I don't know. But yeah, so it's all about exploring music and how that, uh, you know, affects your life. You can totally. Your own rates, you know. What, what, whatever your whatever your goals are, you know, I, I love that about our school. It's like, what do you want to do? We're going to help you get there. If you want to get to conservatory, we're going to help you get there. If you want to connect with yourself and your family more, we're going to help you get there. Um, I just lo I love that because I did the conservatory system too, and there are some there are some benefits to the things you learn, but at the at the essence of it. Even on even at conservatory level, music is you know when you distill it down, music is <laughs> what is music? It's not it's not that career and that thing to you know that's that can be a benefit of it. And of course you can make a career out of music, but what's at the heart and soul of music when you distill it down, right? Like it's it's that human essence and sort of the mystery of who we are and what we are and trying to figure that out. I feel that way about this beer too. I'm like, what is it? I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I, I should probably drink more to see if I can figure it out. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> oh, well, it is 545. Uh, thank you for thank you for joining me. And thank you to everyone watching for joining us. Uh, we hope you have fun and we plan on put our we plan on putting a couple more of these out, so keep your eyes peeled, and we will hope to see you later. 
Thank you. This was so fun. <laughs>